Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video, we're going to be looking at our good friend Fareed from Fareed Responds as he tries to explain why the killer art, that is the different Quran recitations of the multiple Qurans you could say, doesn't demonstrate quite convincingly through the evidence that the killer art are mistakes, that the early scholars of Islam actually differed and argued about what some ayah actually ought to be recited and instead there is a good reason to believe that this in fact goes back to Muhammad because Muhammad said that the Qala'at are legit, they are validated, they are part of the Sunnah. And so no worries, right? There's, there's no issues with this. Don't worry about it. Whoever says that the fact that the Quran means recitation and Qala'at kind of means that or reading and therefore you have multiple Qurans. No, whoever says that, no, they're just making stuff up. You know, that's not true at all. There's only one Quran and there's seven different versions. Well, 10, 10 now, which is slightly awkward. But anyway, let's see how Fareed starts giving his explanation. Let's watch. Ahmed, Ahmed e Muhammad says, why do not, why do we, why do we not critically think that Qira'at are just mistakes? Allah. So there are a plethora of reasons why we ought to think of the Qur'at as most likely best explained through mistakes in the oral transmission and also the written transmission, which we'll get onto. But let's, to start with, look at the oral transmission. We know from early Muslim sources that there were actually many different Qur'at that were recited a few hundred years after Muhammad's death. There are reports of 20, 30, even more. Now, how many Qur'at different recitations of that Quran, or as I would put it, different Qurans, how did they become canonized? How did they become acceptable to the ulama, to the scholars? How did they end up with 10 different Qalat today that are acceptable, that are canon? Straight off the bat, we can see we went from a higher number, like 20, 30, 40, however many that were in circulation at the time by imams in masjids in prayer, down to the acceptable number of 10. Well, it went down to seven and then it went to 10 and then it kind of went to 14 for a while, but then it basically went back down to 10. This should already tell you that we actually have common ground, like whether we disagree or agree on this. The point is simple. There are a substantial amount, more so than there are factual, incorrect, non-canon Qur'at. Why? Again, very simple. We have 10 of them canonized today, but in the past, few hundred years, 200, 300 years after Muhammad's death, there was 20, 30, 40 different Qala. Something happened there and many of them lost favor and we no longer consider them to be valid recitations to be used in prayer. So Muslims will agree and even Muslim scholars will agree with me that from a are there Qala that are mistakes, so to speak, yes, they will have to and will be forced to say yes, there are. The majority of them actually. They would instead argue that the ones that they ended up with that are still known about today and in some senses still in circulation among the Ummah are just the correct ones, the ones that do actually go back to Muhammad and Muhammad really did say it that way. Is, uh, is what uh, opponents of Islam need to think about. They don't put themselves in our shoes. Yeah, they don't put themselves in our shoes. They're looking at these as attacks against the deen. Fareed, I actually do put myself in the position of an average Muslim who will be finding out about this information for the first time. Having been brought up, being told by my family, by my masjid, by my iman, by a sheikh I might watch on YouTube. The point is that this is the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ for healing their illness. And the hadith is authentic. Hopefully not that sheikh. I would have actually said, hey, uh, I believe that the Quran is perfectly preserved, letter for letter, word for word, halakha for halakha. And I would say there is only one Quran and Quran means recitation. Then I would find out, actually, there was this thing called Qur'at, which is different readings of the Quran or different recitations of that singular recitation of the Quran. But it's still one Quran because reasons. And this to me would worry me substantially. If I was a Muslim, I would abandon the idea that there's only one Quran. There's only one recitation. I would abandon that immediately. I would abandon the idea that it's been perfectly preserved textually. I would abandon that quicker than Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, can run away from Sam Shamoon. That's how quickly I would abandon that because I would immediately see that that is simply not something I could argue for and people would keep bringing up pieces of evidence that would contradict the living daylights out of it. Namely, every single different Qadat that has different meanings that we are aware of today. And you know, like if you, if you, uh, 
but I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. So I mean, it says because we have chains of it going back to the prophets. Like, yeah. that's one answer. It's all right. I just want to point this out. It's very weird having Farid read out responses on a live stream only to then rate them. And to be brutally honest about how poor some of these arguments are, it's, it's kind of strange. This guy brings up the Isnads, the science of Hadith. And Farid kind of says, that's okay. That's, that's, that's all right. You know, not too good, not too bad. Which again, not what I was expecting from a Muslim apologist who would probably mostly bring this up in an argument against a Christian in defending Islam, but hey-ho. Ahmed says, Quran is transmitted with Tawajur. That's another one. At least you don't make a big deal out of it, I guess, Farid. But as you probably know as well as I do, even some of the big classical Islamic scholars who specialized in the Qur'at made it very clear that they did not believe it was Tawato, it was not mass transmitted. And they understood this because then you would end up with inconsistencies and difficulties in trying to establish this. But even if you could, you end up with a problem of if someone produces, say, perhaps two to three Sahih chains going back to Muhammad for a narration that is in terrible Arabic grammar or isn't from the Uthmanic Codex, you would have to somehow say that Muhammad really did say that. Because at this point in history, the idea that something is Tawata and goes back to Muhammad through the science of Hadith, that magical, wonderful thing, is beyond question. It, it absolutely must mean in the Islamic worldview. It definitely does. Muhammad definitely said that. How do we know? Because we have multiple independent chains going back to Muhammad that go through some of the most trustworthy companions. So it is beyond question that he actually said it. Now, for anyone who wants to immediately show the plethora, I love that word, of errors that you're going to find in the science of Hadith, I would recommend Dr. Jonathan Little's work, who himself, being a Muslim, has done a comprehensive and perhaps one of the most in-depth studies into the issues with Hadith, and the fact that the likelihood of them reliably going back to Muhammad is, let's just say, marginal. For anyone who wants to check out more on this, you can look at Marin Van Putten's work, or you can perhaps check out Shady Nasser's work. These are two contemporary scholars who are some of the experts in the field regarding this particular topic. Marin Van Putten in particular has done an article on Al Jazali, the one who canonized the 10 different Qur'at in the 15th century, who was known for opposing later on in life the classification of Tuwata or mass transmission arguing that the ayah of disagreement are not mass transmitted. Yusuf Zahran says, All qira'at, 10, we have confirmed today is actually all mutawatir to the Prophet Muhammad, and they are not contradict contradictory, they are compatible. Assassin says, I like how Farid just cuts this guy off. Guess he had no opinion on that, but I have an opinion. So no, I don't think you can establish that the 10 qira'at go back to Muhammad in a reliable fashion. I don't definitely don't think there is a case for Tawata or mass transmission, mostly because there are certain people who were big scholars who seemed not to know about certain Qur'at readings, which were then later canonized. If they were Tawata, why do certain scholars not have who specialize in this or have a very deep interest in this or wrote about this at the very least, who had never heard of them? That I find interesting, and so does Marin Van Putin, whose personal view, it seems, as according to his Twitter page, is that actually there is no way of establishing any reliable method for these ayah of difference or ayah of disagreement to reliably go back to Muhammad. So not to water, not even just reliable rumors or hearsay. Now many Muslims have been told that they don't contradict, they complement each other. The issue I have with this is that this is just lying to save face. To give you a very brief example, there are indexical changes in the Qur'at. Now, from a grammar point of view, if you have an indexical change, you change the entire meaning of the sentence. One example of an indexical difference in one of the Qur'at of the Qur'ans occurs in Surah 37, Ayah 12, where the person who is speaking changes depending on which Qur'at you read. On one Qur'at, it is Muhammad speaking who is amazed. On another Qur'at, it is Allah who is speaking who is amazed. Now you can see changing the person who is speaking makes such a radical difference to the sentence. There is a world of difference between Muhammad saying something or Muhammad being something like amazed or in wonder and Allah being amazed or in wonder. It's 
completely different. And of course, there is, according to Tafsir, a historical context to this verse. This is happening at Muhammad's time to Muhammad as he gets his revelation. So unless you want us to believe that both of these are correct and happened simultaneously in the same context about the same thing, you're going to have to accept that these contradict each other. Also kind of problematic if you're ascribing the attribute of being amazed or shocked or in wonder to Allah, given that he's meant to be foreknowing, so he's meant to know all this or in advance, but nonetheless that theological difference is something for perhaps Farid to solve or maybe some other scholars to resolve. Next, you have just flat out negations. Negation is another kind of grammatical difference that results in a direct contradiction. This is perhaps the most common one you'd think of when you think of a contradiction. If I told you I am recording a video and I am not recording a video in the same context, in the same place, in the same time, that would seem to be a contradiction. This happens in Surah Yunus, Surah 10, Ayah 16. If Allah had willed, I would not have recited it to you, nor would he have made it known to you. But another Qur'at says that actually Allah would have made it known to them. I brought this up with my conversation with Fidel Soliman, and he did indeed acknowledge that yes, there are two seemingly contradictory things being said here in the same verse, in the same Qur'an, in the same Arabic language. His response is merely that, well, these are just hypotheticals that Allah hypothetically could have done. The issue with this though is, whether something is hypothetical or not doesn't change its status as a contradiction. For example, me saying that I'm recording this video and saying that I'm not recording this video in the same context isn't somehow resolved by me saying, well, it's only hypothetical. It's still a contradiction. So if you want to be pedantic, you could say the Quran has contradictions in the multiple Quran versions, the Qur'at, but they're only in the context of hypothetical things. But you've still conceded that there are contradictions in the Quran because from a grammatical point of view, that it's inescapable. If you negate something in the same context, it is by definition a contradiction. You cannot predicate something to an object and then predicate the negation of that very same thing to that very same object in the very same context without that being a contradiction, hypothetical or not. Someone saying, look, we know from the Sunnah that there are multiple narrations that say that when the recitation was given, it was given in seven different modes. That is sufficient to explain all of this. No, it actually just makes the whole puzzle, because it is a puzzle, incredibly difficult and more complex. We need to figure out how there could be seven different recitations of something, because we don't, we're, not, we're never told in the sooner what the differences are, where they amount. We don't even know the context of it. Is the differences in the different surahs? Is that what he means? Or does the, does the different modes apply to the actual verses themselves on a per ayah basis? Does it apply to all the verses? Or is it just some of the verses? Is it based on some sort of categories? Is it based on certain topics or certain themes? But these answers are never given to us. We're just left to speculate. And there are many different opinions held by scholars over the many centuries, or I guess 1,400 years at this point, that Muslim scholars have been trying to resolve this, but they can't, and neither can Farid. Mm. It's interesting. No matter how many cups of coffee Farid has, this question is never going to be answered. The Aruf complicate things. They complicate things because we don't know what they are. And if we don't know what they are, we have no ability to produce them. And because we can't produce them, then we have no way of really being honest and saying that we can produce the Qurans. And I mean that intentionally plural there. Because the Qurans are not defined. The Qurans from a purely flat out common sense point of view, are undefined. We don't know what they actually are. We may be able to have a good chunk of one version of this seven different modes of the Quran, but we don't have any reason to think that any more than that has been preserved precisely because we fail to reproduce it and we can't reproduce it because people like Farid and the Islamic scholars can't tell you what it actually is. To make things even more complicated, the Aruf is seven, right? Seven different modes. Okay, great. But ultimately, all of the Qurans that we have today go back to the Uthmanic manuscript, the Uthmanic codex that Uthman compiled, you know, when he burnt all the other stuff he didn't agree with. That particular thing he produced and sent copies out to the Islamic Empire, that is what all of the Qurans, Qurat, go back to today. Muslim scholars make this point abundantly clear. They, Al-Jazali and Ibn Mujahid, make it clear that if things don't follow the Uthmanic Codex, it's not a valid killer art. And yes, we have examples of things that don't follow the Uthmanic Codex. For example, it's very plausible if someone wanted to make this argument, and there have been Islamic scholars who have made this argument, that we have to consider 
The alternative codexes that certain companions like Abdullah ibn Masud and Nubai ibn Kab had at the time of Uthman as potential candidates for one of the different modes, one of the Aruf. Their argument, which I do think is somewhat quite convincing actually, is why would a companion who has memorized either large parts or all of the Quran, who was considered to by Muhammad to be one of the people whom others should recite the Quran from, have his own codex with such substantial differences, and it not be one of the different modes that Muhammad recited? And it kind of makes sense. If you want to go that way, Farid, you're probably going to have to defend Abdullah ibn Masud's codex as being one of the valid modes of Quran, or one of the valid variants of the Qurans. But then, of course, you end up with substantial problems for two reasons. One, you can't actually explain where the others are, so... And it seems very awfully convenient to say that all the killer arts that we have today, which are not sooner, by the way, there's nothing in the Quran, traditions or narrations that tell you that there was ever meant to be 10 different killer arts that go back to Muhammad. In fact, everything, as Farid has correctly said, is just pointing to seven different modes never even mentions the idea of a kul'at of a recitation, rather just a mode. And so for that reason, we can't prove there is 10 kul'at. It's just scholars later on deciding to go with 10. Why not 7? Why not 14? Why not 20, 30, 40, 50 different kul'at that the early generations had? I'm sure there was some delightful wisdom in them. But it's clear that the Quran has not been perfectly preserved from a textual or even an oral perspective. What Farid might want to consider is the strong, robust, common sense, valid thinking that Christianity provides. We don't say that our scriptures have been perfectly preserved textually because that ignores the very human element involved in copying texts. Yes, Farid, scholars had to copy texts. Scholars make mistakes. To err is human, fundamentally. And humans had to write down your Quran. I mean, I think this was pretty self-evident, but for some reason it still needs to be said. Rather, the message has been preserved. And there are already signs that Muslims are starting to find this kind of perspective, the Christian perspective, very alluring, because it gets them out of the philosophical and theological nightmare that they've embedded themselves in for many decades now, being committed to lying to Muslims about what their theology teaches and about the fact that their Quran is supposedly just one, when in fact it isn't one, or perfectly preserved textually, when in fact you can't even reproduce those texts because the Aruf is lost, and if it isn't for read, produce a long documented list of all the different variations and all different valid Aruf, all seven of them, and everything they contain. I would love to see that because your scholars would be pretty amazed if you can produce it. But until then, the Quran has not been preserved perfectly through textual or oral means. Rasulullah said, Allah revealed the Quran in seven Aruf. In seven Aruf. So that's what so so that's about it what when it comes to that it's a good answer what so wait <laughs> so we have the aruv that's revealed to us that's enough don't ask questions we're good if a christian said this farid you will be kicking off crazy but because one of your presumably fans of your channel and your content suggested it you didn't have the balls to tell them, no, that's actually a terrible argument. You should never argue like that. What you're doing is you're just arguing in a circle. How do we know Islam is true? Because the Quran says so. How do we know the Quran is true? Because the Sunnah says that the Quran is validated in all these different ways, and including in seven modes. How do we know that the Quran really was revealed in seven different modes? Because Islam is true. You can keep going like this for forever and ever, but to anyone who's not a Muslim, it looks pitiful, in all honesty. The Qur'an didn't evolve gradually, they have always been there from the very start. In a sense, yes, but that actually is problematic to you because there are others that are not the 10 that we have today that were there at the start. So some of the earliest Sahaba were reading from wrong Qur'at, apparently. They just didn't know. They were just, you know, reciting their prayers wrong. But hey, I guess it's a good thing that you guys and Farid have got it all right now. Whew, that would have been awkward otherwise. It's also not true that they've always been there because the understanding of what is a valid Qur'at has evolved over time quite demonstrably. You just need to look at the works of Ibn Mujahid and Al-Jazari to understand, again, Ibn Mujahid, 10th century, Al-Jazari, 15th century. We're getting on in time now. To understand that these guys had very particular criteria to what they would consider valid Qur'at. Ibn Mujahid and Al-Jazari didn't pull that out of their behind, they thought about it and came up with this criteria because it made the most sense in trying to determine what was valid and what was not valid. But again, 
they're validating this. They're putting their stamp of approval on this. That wasn't there before. How do we know it wasn't there before? Because there was Kira'at that didn't follow these rules long before them that was in use. So no, uh, the Kira'at did evolve over time, particularly in how you differentiate between canon and good Kira'at and non-canon or bad Kira'at. Mahmoud says, all the Kira'at I read are all the same in meanings. Well, yeah, Mahmoud, I gotta disagree, bro. I gotta disagree. You gotta give respect where respect is due. Fareed does correctly identify the fact that the Kira'at are indeed differing in meaning. They don't say the same thing, as I said before. They often do vary in substantial ways that do affect the meaning and do produce contradictory meanings from a purely technical point of view. But thank you for making people aware of that, Fareed. I do appreciate the increasing awareness of the different meanings in the different Qurans, as I would put it. Assassin says, secondly, it is a miracle because it shows the Quran preserved in different areas by multiple people. Okay. Mm, yeah, I didn't think much of that one either, Fareed. Centuries of scholarship all agreeing that there are multiple recitations to Rasulullah or that there are multiple ways of reading the same book, then this shows that this is the orthodox position. Okay? I have no doubt that in, in Sunni Orthodox Islam, this is the orthodox opinion. I mean, of course, my alternative, which I think makes far more sense, is a lot more simpler and best fits the evidence, is actually the fact that centuries after Muhammad died, many of the ulama were realizing that there were different variations in the different texts and the different recitations that were given in the masjids during prayer. And their way of arguing that this is acceptable, because at this point it was way too late to remove these, it was too influential, it was too ingrained, too many big names had their own recitation that had gained in popularity. So they just said, yeah, uh, hey, uh, wouldn't it be really convenient if uh, we all agreed that this, uh, these different recitations all go back to Muhammad, because Muhammad said that there would be multiple recitations. Oh, that's clever. And then what we can do is we can, uh, we can be incredibly vague about what those are and we can never specify them. And then that way, no one can ever prove that this wasn't the case because there'll be nothing to compare it to. Also, it will stop all the different fighting because it introduces enough ambiguity to satisfy different imams given different recitations. I mean, after all, a lot of these kilat, in terms of the actual Arabic, are very minor, even though sometimes they produce profound differences. And, check this out, all we have to do is hope that people genuinely believe that the Sahaba, those who were the companions of Muhammad, those who knew Muhammad best, when they were hearing him recite, and they heard him recite different ways, and they knew, as Hadith mentions, that there were these seven different modes, they never bothered to ask him what those were exactly. They never bothered to write it down, to take it in memory, to take it in notes. Yeah, they just didn't bother. They didn't think it important enough. They didn't think the recitation that came from Allah really was that important that anyone should really know it. So they naturally, through both an oral tradition and a written tradition, let that collapse. Uh, and that's why today no one knows what the Aruf is from a basic description. It is undefined because the Salaf didn't want to bother to remember it. Seriously though, food for thought. So Farid is kind of now giving his own view. And um, to be honest with you, I actually think the ones that came before him were actually a bit better, to be honest. He tries to somewhat say, well, look, the very fact that this is present very early on, that all these different Qur'at, is proof that it's intentional because it goes back to Muhammad at the very beginning, and hence that's how we can be confident they are not actually mistakes. The issue I have with that is that doesn't make sense. It doesn't get you where you want to be. Here's, here's an alternative for it. How about this? Check this out. Early on, after Muhammad died, people were differing in the old tradition about exactly what the recitation was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's actually it. Um, but Fareed wants you to think that that's actually the crazy option here, that that's the, whoa, people, like, there were issues with an old tradition? When has that ever happened? No, the Islamic tradition, all tradition, is perfect. There's never been any mistakes in it. And that's why the very first verse of Surah al-Baqarah is complete nonsense. <laughs> or in 29 of the other surahs of the Quran, because you don't know what it means. Or the fact that we are not too sure on whether or not the names of the surahs are actually from Muhammad or from the companions who just came to a consensus regarding a significant amount of the names of the surahs. Yeah, the fact that you have 
variations very early on. It's not proof that that's intentional. <laughs> that's like if I set up a restaurant business and it fails a week on, because it failed at the very beginning, that must mean it was intentional. No, Farid, that, that wouldn't mean it's intentional. That would mean I'm probably really bad at running a restaurant. That that would be what most people would uh, <laughs> would uh, would conclude, right? <laughs> Someone wouldn't come up to be like, "Chris, man, you're amazing. You are such a good business owner, and, and running your own restaurant that you intentionally made it fail to prove a point." <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I would just suck at running a business. That's all. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope this is enough to just kind of show you, particularly Muslims out there, that Farid and his scholars, because Farid is actually very representative, to be honest, from from what I see. It's very representative of the awkward state that scholars find themselves in of not being able to actually give a definition to what the Qurans are anymore because it seems, according to scholarship, that the majority of it is likely being lost over the course of history. The seven modes are not definable nor reproducible, therefore it is appropriate to say they are lost. If I tell you I have a, a Lamborghini and you ask me to tell you what the license plate number is and I can't, I don't know it. And then you ask me, okay, can you show it to me? And I say, no, I can't. Then guess what, ladies and gentlemen, it's probably because I don't actually own a Lamborghini. But Farid thinks uh, the fact that I can't show you the Lamborghini is, uh, is intentional. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. If you're not a Christian, then today's the day. You can email me at chrisatspeakerscorner at gmail.com and I will do my best to get back to you. I wish you all a very blessed day and that includes you, Farid. God bless. Take care.